Thank you. Uh, before I jump into this next talk, um, I did want to say, I just want to make sure that you hear me say this. It's so great to be with a bunch of Aussie church planters. I mean, and I don't say that lightly. When I was here, which is ages ago, 16 years ago, there was one thing that church was about, and it was church growth. And that's all it was. It was like, how big can you grow your church by whatever means necessary? And uh, it really is an incredible thing to think that uh, God's, you know, using you all over this place, and it's just so, in, so encouraging. So whatever's happening in your church, wherever you are, big, small, traditional, liturgical, whatever it is, I love it. I love whatever you're doing uh, to really advance the kingdom of God. And uh, so thanks for the privilege of being able to share a few of these thoughts with you today. It really is an honor for me. Okay, this uh, next talk I want to give um, is basically a talk about how to, if you're dealing, now I, I need to give a, uh, a disclaimer, which is this talk is not particularly effective for working class people. Okay, so this talk is geared a little bit more towards the creative class or whatever. And so I realize that, um, you know, some of you are just going to go, the first four points are rubbish, mate. They don't apply to me. But there could just be something in there. So this is the component that says, how do you really help people gain a sense of mission and vision in all of life? Okay, so it's about whole life mission. So I want to start um, just with this analogy. Imagine walking to an, into a movie theater 15 minutes late and then leaving 20 minutes before the movie ends and then just trying to figure out what's happening. Has, it, has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been watching a show and then your spouse comes in and they're like, oh, who's that? What are you watching? And you go, I'm watching a show. And they go, oh, really? And then you just want to go, can you not watch the show? Because you're really annoying. Because if you were here at the beginning, you'd know what this is. And then they leave at the end before it ends, and you're in bed at night, and then they're going, hey, whatever happened to that couple on that show? Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to you guys, hasn't it? I can see it from here. So that's annoying, by the way. That's annoying. So why is it annoying? Because you actually need the framework and the context to make sense of the story. You actually need that. And one of the things that I get a little bit concerned about is that when it comes to the Christian story and how it's presented in the world, we've chopped the beginning off, and we've lopped the end off, or made it really obscure. And so people are running around in the middle of a story they know they're in. And they know who some of the characters are, and, but they're not quite sure how, what, what's actually happening here. And they're trying to figure it out. So Dorothy Sayers, who's you know, brilliant, was brilliant, uh, says this, how can anyone remain interested in a religion which seems to have no concern with nine-tenths of his life? And so whenever you're talking about the missional conversation, it's important to realize that it's not just a bunch of pastors fired up about new ways to do, mission, to do ministry. This has to actually be about how people live in the world. How people live in the world. So if we can go to these slides here, I think I, I popped these in. Um, for most of Christian history, there was a, a more holistic sense about what the story of God was. It was about creation and fall and redemption and restoration. The Bible doesn't start in Genesis 3, it starts in Genesis 1, and it doesn't end in Genesis 20 with, uh, uh, sorry, Revela it doesn't end in Genesis 20 or Revelation 20. Um, and so we've chopped the, these ends of the Bible off, right? And so it used to be that we had a whole encompassing worldview where we understood our created purpose and then how sin played into that. And that these things were part of our framework. But then uh, something happened in church history where basically liberal theology had an assault at the Christian faith. And people began to attack the authority of Scripture, the reliabilities of Christian witness. They began to say that the Bible is just filled with myths and stories. They're nice ones, but they're certainly not reliable, and there's all sorts of errors in the Scriptures. And so a movement arose to sort of respond to that, which was fundamentalism. And fundamentalism was a reactionary movement. It wasn't designed to try and paint a holistic, compelling worldview of mission it was responding to the unique theological assault that was dealing with its day. And so for the most part, that response was around two issues. Half of the story it was about sin and the fall, and it was about the substitutionary atoning work of Jesus Christ and the bodily resurrection proving that we no longer deal with sin and that we have a guaranteed future. And so it was really pressing in onto these things. And so you'll see that as a result of that, the faith that what I came into faith, which was uh, Pentecostal evangelicalism, was basically, fundamentalism became evangelicalism, historically. And so I inherited the gospel that I inherited, true, 
absolutely true, though with the beginning and the end lopped off. So the gospel I inherited was, you're a sinner, Jesus came to save sinners, repent of your sin, and you get to go to heaven when you die. And those things are true, but they're not the whole of the story. And so I began to realize that in order to make sense of all of life, we had to put these things together. Liberals traditionally have been good at people are made in the image of God, and God wants to fix the world. That's been their only song, but they've been really weak on sin, what's actually wrong with the world, and how you actually go about fixing the world. And evangelicals have traditionally been really good about, here's what's wrong with the world, and here's how Jesus is the solution to it. But we haven't had this whole thing. So merging these things together gives us a holistic perspective. So to recover the beginning of the story, to get the whole thing, I want to start where the Bible starts, which is what basically theologians call the creation mandate, which is the primal human job description. Why had God created us, and why does he want us to be here? So Genesis 2, God is a God of work. This is what it says, on the seventh day, God had finished. Now, uh, we, we get so numb to this text, but I just want you to hear this with fresh ears. God finished the work he'd been doing. God finished the work that he had been doing. God was doing some work. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So our universe is framed around God creating. God is a worker this is before sin, this is before the fall, and so we see that that is God's heart. And then we see next to this, when God creates human beings, Genesis 1 says this, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so what did God put people in the world to do? What did he put him in the world to do? To rule, to have dominion, to make something good of the world, to fill the earth and to, to care about what actually happens in the earth. This is before any sin has come into the world. And you read this in Genesis 2, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So God is giving away creative power now. Now, if I was God and I saw what Adam was naming a few of the things, I would have stepped in with sort of some creative oversight, and maybe some curation on God's behalf. But no, just whatever Adam calls it, that's what it's going to be called. And that's how it goes. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. This is an incredible thing. So you see this trend, and it's really important to understand this. God puts all the raw potential resources of life and, and in the world in place and he says to Adam, like, like a dad throwing a box of Legos over to a kid and says, show me what you can do. He says, okay, show me what you can do with the world. And it's your job to make something beautiful of the world. So, what is music? What is music? It's noise. Ordered beautifully so that the human heart can thrive. That's what it is. You get music in the wrong order and it's noise. But you put it in the right way. You arrange it and you think about it and you put your heart into it and something beautiful comes out of the raw chaos of sound. And what is a story? All the raw drama of human experience is ordered in such a way with a narrative arc with tension and release and with redemption and with hope and with the right ending and all the rest of it. And the raw confusion of life is ordered together so that we can make sense through narrative. And you can say that about anything, whether it's technology, whether it's medicine, almost. What is law? It's ordering together the events of life around justice so that people can have a sense of life and wholeness. So, what we see is that, and we see this in creation, God takes all of this chaos and then he's ordering out of the chaos, and he's bringing things together so that they can thrive. And in human culture, culture making in some sense is making order out of chaos. And so we know that that's what we were created to do. That's our primal human job description. That's before there was any sin in the world. And that's why people to this day, because they're made in the image of God, still make stuff in the world. We still do this. We don't do it for the glory of God. We do it for all sorts of reasons. But this is our primal human calling. And so we see that the enemy comes along. And who is Satan? Satan's real. Who is Satan? He comes along and he wants to destroy God and destroy God's creation and God's culture. Now, he knows that he can never get God's authority because 
God's too powerful, God's sovereign. But he realized that God has given Adam and Eve dominion and authority in the world, and so he deceives them so that he's the one that ends up with the authority in the earth. And that's why the scriptures say he's the prince and power of the air. That's why they said the whole world's under the control of the evil one. It's not meant to be. It was meant to be under Adam and Eve's control, stewarding with God as partners. So sin enters the world, and then God, the, the fall comes in, everything's damaged and it's broken. It's, there's a, a real sense of dissonance with the original creation. It's not as God wants it to be. And then the promise comes that the seed of woman is going to come into the world. So women are saving the day. We're thankful for that, right? That's their part in redemption that God's given them. The fall comes. God addresses her and even gives her hope. And there's going to be enmity. So the world is now contested space. It's the evil one's world, but now the kingdom of God's in it and it's advancing. And this is why Jesus comes. Jesus said he came to drive out. It says the strong man's been bound and now he's plundering the house. And so the kingdom of God is where the rule and reign of God is worked out in the world, in all of life and in all of the world, not just the human heart. And so Jesus comes and he gets everything right that Adam got wrong. And then he says, now I want you, because I have the authority back, I'm commissioning you in my name to go and make disciples of all nations and to fill the earth and to be involved with not just saving souls, but filling the earth with the glory and rule and reign of Jesus. So that's the first bit. Now, how do we, so that gets us sort of at the beginning of the story. Now, how does the typical person go about doing this? How do we order our lives and hearts in such a way that that actually becomes a reality? So here's a few principles about helping people do this. Number one, the starting point is the motives of our heart. It's not our behavior that we do. It's actually the motives with which we do them. Or this is the power of holy intent. 1 Thessalonians 4 says this, this should be your ambition to live a quiet life, mind your own business, and work with your hands, just as we commanded you before. And as a result, people who are not Christians will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others to meet your needs. Well, this verse here, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whatever you do, eat or drink, whatever it is, do it all for the glory of God. Now, this term glory is an interesting phrase. I know you know all this, but the term kabod, weight or heaviness, it's got other meanings. But in some sense, it means that there's a sense of weight there's a sense of importance to something. And this is what God is like. If everything there is in the universe, he's the most weighty, he's the most important. And so how do you do your job for God's glory? Which means we have the possibility to, to take things that seem incredibly mundane and meaningless and they all of a sudden take on this new weight and heaviness and significance because they're done for God. And so in the book Shaping Your Things to Come, Alan Hirsch, good Aussie bloke, he tells the story about the idea of kavana, which is this, the power of holy intent. And it's a teaching of the, the Jewish rabbis where they said that when uh, the fall happens, the glory of God was shattered from creation. And when we do things with holy intent, we're bringing the glory of God back tangibly to the world. So it's a famous story about a cobbler. Every time he stitches the top of the shoe to the bottom of the shoe, he's reuniting the glory of God with creation because of his motives that he's doing it. And so this, I think, is a primal part of what we're called to do. We forget that for 30 years, Jesus labored in total obscurity, doing manual labor. And if it was okay for Jesus, that it's not beyond us. And so we need to get this particular framework. Uh, I began to realize that this was a deeply transforming experience when I was a butcher. Like I said, it's the middle of like this Toronto blessing thingy. Church is going mad. And then I would just like come out of church just like, oh. I think I was in heaven, I'm not sure, but it sure felt like it. Oh, now I'm in the butcher shop. This is definitely not heaven and doesn't, feels like the other place actually a little bit. And so I'm in the meat factory and it's really hard to try and integrate the Shekinah glory with making sausages. There does not seem to be a direct correlation theologically that I could come up with. So I'd be in the butcher shop and I'd go in and I'd like make like, you know, what are you doing today, John? Got to, you know, bone out these chicken breasts and then like cut up a bunch of side of lambs and make some mince meat and, uh, you know, clean up a bunch of stuff. And, and I just couldn't figure out, what, how does this connect with the wonder and glory of God? And then I began to realize that what I did had the possibility to be worship if I did it for God. And this could actually take on real significance, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be meaningless or a waste. This could really matter to God. So I would go to work early. I you know, had the keys for the shop. I'd go in early, and I'd get my knives, my big butcher knives, and I'd get on my knees, and I would hold my knives up to God, and I would say, God, nobody else is going to see what I do today. 
But you do. I know you see me. I know you saw Job. Nobody saw that, but it was a one-on-one audience with you. So here I am. Here's my knives. And I don't know how chopping up Bambi is going to glorify you today, but as I do, may people say best sausages, best meat patties, best mints, best rack of lamb I've ever had in my life. And you and I will know that this was done for you. And it completely changed my life. And so before, when I was a sloppy worker, all of a sudden I started caring of what I'm doing. Every tray of meat I'd put in, I'd be like, how's that one? God, you like that? It's pretty good, isn't it? I'd pop it in the window and everything I'd do. And you know what ended up happening? My work stood out. I won Apprentice of the Year. And so I was top of my class at the Technical Institute. I won some money that enabled me to come to the United States. I was in the local paper. Like all this stuff. Now, here's the thing. Does that matter? John was really good at butchering. Yeah, you know, like, does that matter? Not really. But here's the lesson that God taught me. When I was walking away from the awards ceremony at the Technical Institute, I felt God say to me, listen, I knew you were going to go into ministry, but in this season of your life, I want you to know that I saw it and that it mattered and that it pleased me. Well done, mate. Well done. God does have an Australian accent. He says, well done, mate, a lot. We just know that. We know that. We know that. It's so obvious, but I'd just like to point that out. The power of holy intent the power of holy intent. It's getting our motives sorted out. Then number two, it's the issue of evangelism. The issue of evangelism. How do you go about doing evangelism in a world like ours? It's really, t- it's really, really hard um, to be able to say to people, hey, mate, how was the weekend? Good. Yeah, well, listen, I just need you to know this. You're going to burn in hell forever unless you repent. And the good news, Jesus has shed his atoning blood on the cross. And if you repent and have faith, you'll be able to go there. So that's good, mate. You want to, you want to, do you want to repent of your sin? I mean, like, it's really awkward. We don't have plausibility structures to sort of tee up conversations about Jesus in everyday life that just don't seem bizarre. It seems really hard on how to do it. And then there's another principle at work, um, which folks in New York talk about all the time, is a very real factor is the role of HR, where HR people just get involved and they say, you cannot proselytize at work, you cannot share your faith. And... Uh, one, a couple of our friends in New York said that you know, some people in the gay community would, would often use HR as a tool to their advantage. And so well, he's a Christian. He said that I was wrong because I'm gay. And he's like, I did not say anything like that. But they would use whatever leverage in a cutthroat environment possible to try and keep people back. So it's tough to be a Christian in the workplace. It's tough to share your faith. So how do we go about doing it? Well, there's a key verse here in 1 uh, Peter 3.15 that says this. And as we look at this verse, we always chop the first bit of this verse off, don't we? We always start with, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have. But actually it says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. And it is the Lordship of Jesus in your heart that actually produces the hope that makes people go, what's that? So no Lordship, no supernatural, compelling, provocative hope. And that's why we have to start with ordering our hearts and getting our motives right. In your hearts, prepare Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone that asks you. But do this with gentleness and with respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. And so it's this lordship that we have that gives us the capacity to do this. So how do we do this? We embed ourselves. I mean, people are already embedded in their life. They're doing their thing. They're doing it with holy motives. They've, you know, in some ways announced their Christian faith, which is really easy to do. I remember when God specifically was pushing my heart, I want you to tell the butchers at work that you've become a Christian. Easy environment to go, hey, guys, just been born again, so no, no biggie. You know, it's like a really hard environment. So you just simply say, here's my starting point is, if you've got people and they work with people and nobody knows they're a Christian, which is probably more of your people than you know. You say, well, how'd the weekend go, mate? Yeah, really good. You watched the game? Yeah, not bad. Wish they'd play a bit better. Good. What did you do Saturday night? Yeah, went out with the missus, saw a film, had a couple of drinks, sweet. What did you do Sunday? I went to church on Sunday morning and then uh, saw another game Sunday night. And you know what those people heard? You went to church! This nut job went to church! That's all they heard in that little sort of, little regular. They just said, okay, we've got a Christian in our midst here. And that's it, your work is done. And then all you have to do is be faithful and work, and then two things will happen. There'll be two opportunities that arise. Personal crisis, and then these cultural crises. And some of the stories that I've even heard these stories shared, which I loved, um, one of the Arab blokes this morning was just telling this amazing story. We forget that most people are lonely and isolated and they don't have support mechanisms for hard times in their lives. Do you know what a powerful force a loving community of Christians is in the world? It's so powerful. And so when someone comes along and they get a cancer diagnosis, where do they turn? Family's often in another state or they're estranged from their family. And they will often go, hey, mate, you're a Christian. Does your church have counselling or something? 
find out their spouse is having an affair, do you guys do marriage counselling? Single person living together, hey, we want to get married. Hey, does your church do marriages? And so we basically position ourselves with the beautiful, rich resources of the body of Christ behind us. And when people have these personal crises, we can often be the people they're drawn to because where else do they go? And the second one is cultural crisis. Is this a cultural crisis happening right now in the US? I don't know you know about it, but 13 people shot in another gun, gun massacre in DC right now. And I know that when I get back that we're going to address that from our pulpit. How can a loving God let this stuff happen? What does God think of violence? What about the sovereignty of God? Is there a set amount of time people live? Why, why not? All this sort of stuff. And we get these cultural moments when people ask larger questions. And it's our job to have these answers teed up, in some sense sort of like reverse shock doctrine. Politicians have doctrines and things they want to implement and they wait for crises and they shove it through when people are afraid and would never vote sanely in their right mind. It's American history. So that's what they would do. So as a result of this, we have the same sort of opportunity. We have these answers ready and when these moments happen, we can say, hey, did, did you know that for 2,000 years people have actually really wrestled with that? There's some phenomenal answers. So if we, in fact, our church is doing a series right now on this stuff. Would you like to come or our, our small group's doing this thing? Right? We only get these rare moments. Next slide here. How many of you, um, next one. Um, how many of you have seen the Engel scale of evangelism? Like I said, everybody basically. Let's just skip all that stuff then because we don't have a whole lot of time. Number three. So that was the second principle was, was on the issue of evangelism. Lordship of the heart. And you, these, uh, these, I'm leaving these slides, so if you don't understand it, you can just get the slides and do whatever you want with it. Um, the third thing is the issue of excellence and influence. Excellence and influence. Colossians 3 says this, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And so we are called to do our work for Jesus. We're called to do stuff in such a way that maybe, maybe people don't ever know it, but we just go, man, that was excellent. And part of the reason why the church, I think, has been so ineffective in the larger culture is that we just don't do great work. We just don't, we sort of sentimentalize, well, if it's Christian, it's good enough. And we don't end up often doing world-class work. Proverbs 22, 19 says this, Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings. He will not serve before obscure men. And so... We need to not just have sort of sloppy aesthetics and not really care. We actually realize that influence comes through excellence. That God is honored when there's excellence. And most of the great art in history was done. Bach signed his pieces for the glory of God. So the great painters were painting and they were doing it for God's glory. So they were leveraging their talent. They had a lot of care and compassion about what they did because they cared about influencing people towards God's glory. And so it's the classic statement, you know, you know, would you rather have a Christian shoddy heart surgeon prepare heart surgery, but he loved you and knew you were going to heaven and he was in your small group? Would you rather have a secular atheist world-class heart surgeon do the surgery? You'd rather have the atheist bloke, wouldn't you? You would. And I think that's so many truths. Like the, the basic rule is, I hope I don't offend anybody, it doesn't matter, I'm going to leave, but don't use the Christian yellow pages. That was like the golden rule. If they've got a Christian fish sticker, right, on their mechanic shop, it's like, do not visit. It's like the basic thing, principle. But anyway, I feel a bit of tension in the room. I'll just move on. <laughs> Give you an example. This is a girl in our church. Uh, her name's Dana Tanamachi. She's like a, uh, works in the arts, great girl. And um, she's part of our community. She's really faithful. She really loves Jesus. And uh, she does all sorts of stuff. So one night at a party, somebody had painted um, like a chalk thingy on the wall, uh, a blackboard, and then she just started drawing on it. And she ended up being pretty good at it. Next slide. And so she ends up beginning to craft these things. And she's so, she just gets good and she hones her craft and she does it for the glory of God. And as a result of her doing great work for all sorts of people that you wouldn't believe. Next slide. This is what's ended up happening to her. She does the cover of Time magazine. Next slide. You might have heard of Oprah. She does that for Oprah. Next slide. Uh, this is her life manifesto. This is the print she sells. Live a quiet life, work with your hands, 1 Thessalonians 4. So she is, this is a famous print that everybody's putting up in their houses. And she's like trying to do it for the glory of God. And so this is an example when you do stuff well, the world can't deny it, and then it gives you the right to begin to talk to people. And, and I can't tell you how many phenomenal conversations from people like this who are actually have, have worked at their craft where people have credibility that's undeniable because of their excellence that gives them the platform to say whatever they want. 
You'd be amazed in New York right now the people that God has in crazy positions who are that good and can say whatever they want. The, uh, many of the, uh, there's a bit of a, I don't know, it's on the internet or whatever, but uh, there's so much amazing stuff happening in Broadway right now where stars of shows are sold out Christians praying for the places that they're working. And they, it's just a really incredible thing. Uh, Bonner was asked once, oh, uh, Billy Corgan. How many of you saw Billy Corgan's recent interview? It's good. Uh, Billy Corgan's interview is really interesting. He said, what's the future of rock and roll? And he says, God is the future of rock and roll. And they're like, God, come on. And he goes, yeah, like, yeah so rock and roll is a bit about sex. It's been about rebellion. And he says, those themes are so tight and played out. He says, I think exploring God is the future of rock and roll. And so the lady says, well, hasn't Christian rock been done? Like, if you could say anything to Christian artists, what would you say? And, they'd say, and he said something like, dear Christian world, you too has already been done. Stop sounding like you too, you know? And I think it was that kind of thing that you know that it's Christian because it's not quite as good as the world. Like, you know, that must be the Christian version of you too. It's not quite as good. And uh, we don't want to be like that. And so if you're an artist and if you're in, whatever you do, I just want to challenge you to reach your redemptive potential because I think that that honors God. Number four, industry renewal and finding the redemptive edge. Uh, culture is not neutral. When culture accelerates, it forms into systems. Uh, I think about uh, C.S. Lewis's addition to the screw tape letter, and there's an addition that's called Screw Tape Proposes a Toast. And at the end of it, it says, like, it's actually brilliant. But, and I think he's talking about communism, but he's got this little, little statement in there, and he says this. He says, this, he's talking um, to the lowest form of temptorship, like for the pleb demons. He's like, the pleb demons work one-on-one -on -one with people. But the real powerful demonic assignments are getting movie stars and industry leaders, because if you get them, you get everything that comes with them. And he was basically saying, if you win the framework of the system, you get everybody in the system. And it's only the little idiot demons that deal one-on-one -on -one with people. And it's just a reminder that we live in a time of history that is so accelerated and so interconnected that we are dealing with issues of systemic nature. And so that means that you can rarely just do one thing that affects everything. It's all interconnected. And so industries as a whole and these systems are either moving towards brokenness or they're moving towards redemption, but they're really neutral. They're really neutral. Those neutral days are gone. So, for example, finance is either moving towards greed and exploitation or finance is moving towards stewardship and ethics and generosity. The fashion industry is moving towards sustainable uh, production, beauty and creativity, or it's moving towards exploiting sexuality and the thin veneer of beauty. Culture is not neutral. And so... Um, I've had the privilege of, of meeting a couple of venture capitalists in my time. And venture capitalists are basically wealthy people who are trying to figure out where culture is going. They're trying to find the next Instagram or the next Facebook or the next whatever. And so what they want to do is they hear these pitches from all these young startups and all the rest of it. And they will bet that one of them is going to get into a sphere of an industry and it's going to bend that industry in a certain direction or it's going to break out in that industry. And so they allocate time, energy, resources, and coaching to things that they think will shape or break an industry. And I thought, Christians are actually called to be spiritual venture capitalists. We're actually to go, where is an industry heading? Is it towards brokenness? We're not going to have anything to do with that. But when people plot their careers and get their education, we need to help them to have a vision of where an industry could be under the rule and reign of Jesus. And we need to help like spiritual venture capitalists get behind that now so that it can help break out and move in a different direction. Um, it's one of those amazing things to realize that um, God cares about human culture and that human culture is actually going to redefine what heaven is about. And God cares not just about souls, but he cares about kingdom. He cares about everything that happens in the world. If, it, if any of you guys read our Richard Mao's book, uh, When the Kings Come Marching In, okay, can I just say this to you? Buy and read Richard Mao's book, When the Kings Come Marching In. It will rock you. I mean, I really believe that. You'll, you'll come out just going, how have I never seen this? He basically says, the Apostle John's nicked off a bunch of Isaiah, like he's taken it, and then he's expanded on it based on a revelation of what God has for him. Am I dying? Yeah. Sweet. 
So that's his big take. So he basically says, the worst job Christians have done is thinking, is, is painting a picture of what heaven is going to be like. So he said this is actually something interesting. He believes that we can make and contribute to culture in such ways, and this is actually N.T. Wright's take as well, is that we can produce these cultural goods that are so good and they're so compelling that they become these exhibits of glory that could possibly even make it into the new heavens and the new earth. That we can do things so great that God's like, listen, man, that's too good. We've got to have that in there. Listen to this verse in Revelation 21. Listen to what he says. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gate ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. So what is heaven like? It's a giant city filled with the glory and splendor and wonder of the nations. Now, what is the glory and splendor of a nation? What is that? So I say this, what is the glory of the African-American community? What, what are some examples? So someone yells out, gospel music, and you go, yes, my favorite, John Coltrane, Love Supreme. If that's not in heaven, there's something wrong. That thing is from God. And so there's all of these, there's all of these things that you hear and you just go, that is glorious. And that every culture has parts that are broken and they have parts that you just go, that's it, that's the best of it. And we actually see this picture that heaven is a place where the best of human culture, the glory and honor of all of these kings and nations has been brought into the holy city, into God's presence. And I personally believe it's the best of arts and creativity and technology. And heaven's going to be this mind-boggling place where the futility of the fall is gone, we're working, it's for the glory of God. All of these incredible things fill this city and we actually thrive in our creative capacities that God wants us actually to be. And so having an industry and moving an industry towards that particular vision can completely change people's lives. Okay, number five. I'm almost done, then we'll have a few questions. Number five is about stewarding privilege. Stewarding privilege. You know, um, Andy Crouch, have you guys read much of Andy Crouch? He's got a book coming out called Playing God, which you must read. It's better than Keller on Idols, if that's possible. Playing God by Andy Crouch. And one of, one of the things that he talks about that is really, really fascinating is he talks about the role of privilege in society. And he had this insight. He said, you know, the poor, for the most part, just want a job, don't they? He says, man, if I could just get a job, if I'm underemployed or unemployed, I just want to get a job. And you get a job, and a job is trading time for money. He says, but then you can get a good job or a little bit of a career, and what is that? Is that's when you actually get pay. You would be willing to do it for less, but they pay you more. Well, you're kind of like, I'd do this for 30 grand and I'm making 55. That's amazing. That little principle is called an economic principle called rent, which means I'm actually getting more than I'd be willing to do it for less. And he said, but there's something better than rent. And you know what it is? It's royalties. Where you do something once and you never have to do it again. You just sit back and it just comes rolling in. And you think, what could be better than royalties? And he says, there's something better than royalties. He says, it's privilege. Privilege is when you've done nothing and a whole bunch of benefits come rolling in. And he basically says that if you're white and you live in Western culture, you are the absolute top of the food chain. You are the privileged ones. And he says, you look at the state of the world. He said, so his example is, he said, one day I was in um, Dubai and he said, there was all of these migrant workers and they were getting ready to, to fly out somewhere and he's at the back of the line. And the stewardess comes up to him and says, excuse me, sir, would you come with me? And he just goes to the front of the line. And he said, I just felt so horrible. I felt so uncomfortable. These people, these are people who are made in the image of God. Why am I getting this? And he realized, oh, this is privilege. I've got cultural privilege here. And one of the things he realized is that when you study the scriptures and you study what God's like, is that privilege is never for its own sake. It is always to be stewarded on behalf of others. So if you're blessed and you're prospering, it's not just so that you can enjoy it. It's so that you can distribute this on behalf of others. And the biggest example I can think of about this is the person of Jesus. Philippians 2, that passage where Jesus, and then you think of the other images where Jesus, who is God, is washing his disciples' feet. We do a Monday Thursday service and when we do the foot washing stuff, every year I break down because I realize Jesus Christ washed people's feet. 
That's the God we serve. It's just absolutely unbelievable. Why would he do that? He took all of his privilege and he put it aside on behalf of others. He leveraged what, he's, what he had to raise up people who couldn't do it for themselves. And he didn't do it because he felt sorry for them. He did it because he loved them. And this is the position for power and privilege in culture. And so the better we do in our careers, the more we advance, the better ahead we get. It's our job to steward privilege on behalf of others. And the world knows that Christians should love and serve the poor. The world knows that. And every time Christians love and serve the poor properly, the world says, that's right, that's it. And that's why the salvos are so great. One of, my, uh, one of the guys I was working in the butcher shop oh, hated God, just like would mock me and vehement against God. One night we're over at the pub having a couple of drinks after works and the salvos come in in a uniform, right? So there's not like a great lot of cultural relevance wearing an army uniform for God in a pub in Elizabeth South, right? Those of you from Adelaide know what I just said. And so he comes in, and then my mate Steve-O puts, gives, him, gives this bloke money. I said, why do you do that? He says, he says the, I'll always be loyal to the salvos. He said, when I was a little kid, we had a Christmas where there was no food and presents, and the salvos came and brought us food and presents. And I just thought, mate, that they, they've got so much cultural credibility. And uh, we are called, and so when you look at the passage in Isaiah 58, which we don't have time to read, but if we go to the last slide on Isaiah 58, it says this, and what will happen? It says that your night will become like the noonday, your light will rise in the darkness. And so the church is at its best when it's leveraging its privilege on behalf of the poor. The way that we try and emphasize this in our church is not by just shoving products at the poor, it's through mentoring. I think mentoring is the key. It's the church's big opportunity. Such a problem with fatherlessness. And that when we step in and we begin to mentor, and we don't just tell them about God, we teach them how to live and how to thrive. And so we've got a girl who lives in the poorest neighborhood in America. It's called the South Bronx. And it is an absolute nightmare of a neighborhood. And she's moved right into the middle of it. She works with the poorest of the poor. And what she does with these kids is she tries to help connect them with all of the privilege of people in our church who are living in these exquisite world-class neighborhoods. And her job is not just to, to feel sorry for them or fix them up. She, she helps let the dreams of their heart, their horizon of possibility to be enlarged and through mentoring, bring them into a different future. And they do, they do the most compelling stuff. And as a result of it, she's got a level of authority to be able to speak. And so we are called to steward privilege, which means when we talk about mission, we're not just talking about having coffee in great neighborhoods in Melbourne, which is what mission often defaults to. And I'm a sucker for great coffee in neighborhoods like the ones in Melbourne. And it's just a reminder that we're called beyond that. And then lastly, uh, number six, it's about learning uh, renewal, rest, resistance, and being in the kingdom of God. One of the biggest challenges people have about the issue of work is that they become what they do. And this is our whole paradigm in society, isn't it? How are you, mate, John? What do you do? Every party you go to, you meet someone. One of the first questions, oh, what do you do? And this defines so much of uh, what we're about. And it's almost impossible not to have our sense of worth and success and identity tied up in our performance in the world. But if that's the case and our identity is not rooted deeply in Jesus, we just become addicted to approval or success. And we end up being very, very thin people and we run after the same things as the world. And uh, one of the things I began to see is that if, if, if Americans were to write the gospel, right? If Americans were going to make the gospel, here's what they would do. Prophecies, da 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 bing, Jesus is born, fantastic. He's born of a virgin, which is off to a pretty good start, right? And so he gets born of a virgin, and then a little bit of turmoil, a little bit of fleeing here and there, settles down. Somehow, you know, he's a great teenager. He's not running off with the girls. Where does Jesus go when he's a teenager? To the temple, and what does he do? He's debating and he's talking about the law. He's about his father's business. It's fantastic. And the next time we see Jesus, he rocks up. John the Baptist is there and he's, he's doing the baptism and that's sweet. And then Jesus calls disciples and they're following him and he begins to build. He's doing miracles. He's giving the Sermon on the Mount. He's Magna Carta. It's brilliant. It's powerful. The people are challenged. He's got followers everywhere he goes. He's, he sees Herod and he's like, go tell that fox. He's sticking it to the man. He sees the Pharisees he's like, you sons of hell, you brood of vipers. He's getting stuck in him and then he gets crucified. 
He gets crucified. The Father pours out his wrath on the Son. All of our sins are placed on Jesus. He's punished in our place. He rises again victoriously, proving our debt is paid, overcoming sin, Satan, death, and hell. It's incredible. Uh, Easter tide happens, right? He's appearing to people. He gets all the people that sort of fell out. They're trying to nick off to Emmaus. He gets them back. Uh, Thomas is doubting. Peter's fishing. He's like, come back, come back. Wins them all back. And at the ascension, heaven opens. And the father cheers and says, well done. That's my son in whom I love and I'm well pleased. That's how Americans would write the gospel. But the thing is, that's not how the gospel goes. Here's the gospel. Jesus does manual labor for 30 years. And then gets baptized and the heavens open, the father's like, that's my son who I love and I'm well pleased in him. And what's Jesus actually done? Stuff all. He's done nothing. He hasn't healed anybody. He hasn't fixed the world, confronted the Pharisees. He hasn't. He's just been working in obscurity. But what had he been doing for 30 years? He'd been loving and obeying his father. And ultimately what the Father wanted was just that love. And because Jesus knew that he was blessed and affirmed before he did anything, he was never a slave to the crowd. He was always tuning his ear to the Father. And you watch all the manifestations in the gospel when the Father shows up to talk about Jesus and he always says, listen to him, this is my son and I love him. The constant voice of affirmation filled Jesus' ears so he was freed from the the power and pressure of the crowd. And we have to get our people to see that you're not what you do. If you're, that, if you're successful, don't take yourself too seriously because it'll change. And if you're not that successful, don't worry about it because it'll change. And if you're not that successful and it doesn't change, don't worry about it because we have eternal life, because you've got a new family, a new community. You're in the people of God. You're known, you're loved, you're wanted, all of those sorts of things. And so that has to be our primary task of remaining in Jesus' love and having our identity rooted and tied up in Him. And then the last point here is that we have to learn to rest. We have to live sustainable lives because if we don't, the first thing that goes when you get really busy is your love for people, your sense of wonder, your joy, and your delight in life. These are the things that begin to melt away. And so we have to realize that we're, that we're called not to sort of grind away all week and try and get a day off to get our hearts back. We're called to intentionally rest so that out of the overflow of that, we can go back into all of the chaos and create order which is what God has called us to do. So these basic principles, giving people the whole story, giving them the whole story, helping them see the nature of contested space for the kingdom of God in the middle of human history and all of life, helping people deal with their motives, helping people learn how to share their faith in these opportunities, helping people have a vision for excellence, helping people think about the redemptive edge of their industry and how it impacts eternity, helping people steward their privilege and helping people have their identity rooted in Jesus rather than their performance are just some of the ways that we're helping and learning to make disciples uh, in New York.